again friends and welcome back to the channel, thank you for visiting. This week's video is all about one of the most ubiquitous pieces of feminine viking kit, the apron dress. The apron dress of course goes by many other names depending on the region and the language spoken, but for the sake of simplicity we're going to call it an apron dress today. If you're new to this channel let me introduce to you what I'm trying to do. With this whole updating my wardrobe series, I'm trying to recreate items for my Viking wardrobe from my impression as close to historically accurate with the information that we have to hand. This means that for some things I have solid evidence for my conclusions and for some other things I'm kind of having to make some educated guesses. First of all, let's talk about the context of the apron dress. The apron dress in and of itself is probably not something that the average Viking woman wore in everyday work circumstances. Why do I say this? Because of the accessories. Things like tortoise brooches and all the jewellery and all the bits and pieces that you hang off it. You can pretty confidently say that most of those things are more status objects than they are. It is noisy for lockdown today and windy. It's been windy all week, I can't avoid it. In most circumstances, I'd be pretty confident to say that the apron dress is not a garment worn in everyday working life. And I say this primarily because of all the things that go along with wearing an apron dress. It's just so freaking impractical to wear all of that stuff if you're trying to tend to a campfire and look after kids and do actual work around, say, a farm or something like that. There's just so much that gets in the way. Also, I look at it in the sense of things like the strands of beads and the big tortoise brooches and all the things that dangle off them, like keys and various bits and pieces. A lot of those were expensive, like metal is precious, so it gives the impression to me that those are more than likely things of status, things you would wear when you're trying to impress people. So chances are the apron dress is something akin to, obviously don't hate me in the comments, I'm saying akin to, it's not exactly the same as, a surcoat. Something that you put over top of your everyday gear or maybe even some of your nicer stuff to really elevate your status when you're going to say a feast or some sort of formal occasion. So the apron dress, while I love it and I want it and we're going to work on it in this video, is probably not something you're going to see me wear all the time for this reason. For most of what I'm doing with my impression, I'm just going for working, everyday kind of person. I'm not trying to be high status. I'm not trying to go to fancy events or anything like that. I'm just trying to be working class. So the apron dress is not going to be something I wear all the time. It's a one-off, maybe twice a year sort of thing to wear if there's something special going on at an event. All of that said, now let's look at some other bits of context to help us out with historical accuracy. My impression is primarily Irish Viking. So what textile evidence do I have to suggest that the Irish Vikings wore apron dresses? And actually, once again, we come up with basically nothing. There are no textile fragments that I have seen so far that scream to me apron dress. There's a lot of fragments, and there's a lot of things that we can pretty safely assume are other garments, but there's not really anything that says apron dress. That's problematic. So how do I know that people of Viking descent, at the very least, in Ireland wore apron dresses. Well, that's because textiles are not, not the only things we found. We have found tortoise brooches, the key indicator of apron dresses. Some of you who have been following this channel for a little while know that I do have a set of tortoise brooches that I absolutely love. I have a set made by a lovely individual named Adam Parsons from Blue Axe Reproductions. These ones are based on the 35.3 typology. They are roughly akin to the brooches that are found in, and I'm going to butcher this name, don't at me in the comments, the Kilmanhain Graves. Someone who's Irish will probably pick me up on that one. I'm sorry, I do not mean to offend. So, tortoise brooches in the grave, fantastic. We've got evidence for apron dresses. Still no textiles though, that's slightly problematic. 
We do have some information from mainland Scandinavia and other parts of Europe where tortoise brooches have been found, where the textiles have basically corroded into the metal on the back of the brooches. So we can see weaves and we can see the loops and how that all was kind of constructed at that point that attaches to the brooch. Some other fragments of what is perceived to be apron dresses have been found in various other places, things like the Kostrop uh, apron dress as well is really well known for all those pleats in the front of it. Um, but in terms of the Irish archaeology, it's a lot of guesswork. So for what I'm doing, I'm going to keep it really simple. We're just going for a plain, nothing fancy, straight cut apron dress. So we've established how little evidence we're working with in terms of textile evidence. That doesn't mean that I can't formulate my plan based on what textile evidence is in Ireland. So we know that there are fragments of tablet weave. We know that there are fragments of weft chevron weave in small bands. Cool, we can sort of put those to the side. They're not relevant to what I'm doing right now. What else can we cover off on? Well, there's plenty of evidence of twill, there's a tiny bit of evidence of tabby, and there's some evidence for some chevron weave. Chevron weave fabric is pretty dang cool in my opinion, and having tried to weave it myself, I also understand that it's not as simple as plain weave fabric. <laughs> I'm sure Viking weavers would have been far more competent than I, because they would have had to do it far more regularly than I. I am fortunate enough to have off-the-bolt fabrics at my disposal as the modern Viking. But what this means is I have selected a fabric to make my apron dress with. So this fabric has cream coloured or, or natural white fleece. It's not quite white, but it's, it's close to white um, for the warp threads. And it has a very light brown for the weft threads. So it's pretty neutral in its current state, very lovely, but not exactly the colours I think of for a high status garment, or at least for the garment I'm going to wear to a fancy event. So I'm going to dye it. Now if you followed some of my other videos, you will have seen some of my dye experiments. So I do have a general idea about the sort of tones that I want, some of the archaeology that's been found. I've looked at dye analyses. For the Irish Vikings, we have a few colours at our disposal, one of which is madder. There's good documentation for madder, but it's not the only dye. We also have yellow X. That's a yellow pigment where they haven't quite established what it was that created that yellow dye. Yellow's kind of cool. Um, we also have uh, indigotin, which comes from probably woad for the Vikings. That's nice. Blues are lovely. But it's not, in my opinion, uniquely Irish. So that basically leaves me with the option of Orkel Lichen. Not many people will probably have heard of it unless you're really niche into historical dyeing techniques or you're into fungus and mushroom dyeing. It's a very niche group of people. But most Viking reenactors would at least have some peripheral knowledge of lichen dye being used. What lichen dye achieves, depending on your setup, can be anything from like bright pinks through to nice muted purples. Lichens tend to be pH sensitive, so that can affect your dye bath quite a lot. So how do I establish what colour I'm going to use of the colour palette of lichen for this material? Thankfully, the University of Nebraska has actually done a wonderful paper that I'm going to link in the description for you to check out. It actually compares the purples of lichens with the purples of mollusk dyes. So murex or Tyrian purple for those of you who do uh, Middle Eastern or Mediterranean impressions where that was a fairly common thing. You can compare the purples achieved with the mollusks versus the lichens and have a look at, at working them both together. So yes, I'm going to be using that paper from the University of Nebraska and there are a couple of different shades of purple in there that I really like, but it's going to be tricky. And it's going to be tricky for one major factor. I can't actually use lichen. Because I'm in Australia and the lichen is in Ireland, we've got some issues. I can't import lichen 
to use as a dye here. I totally understand why I'm not going to try and mess with the ecology of either Ireland or Australia. That's not an issue here. It does, however, put a bit of a roadblock in there for me. So if I can't use those lichens, and none of the lichens I've tried so far that are indigenous to Australia have given me purple, what do I do? The answer for this one means I have to turn to commercial dyes. I'm going to try and turn this into as close to lichen purple as I possibly can using commercial synthetic dyes. I don't know how well I'm going to go, I'm going to give it a shot. Yes, I got distracted, now it's night time, different lighting. Let's roll with it. So let's talk about lichen purple. In this table we can see what kinds of purples were possible with orcal lichen. Specifically I want to hone in on the wool and silk. In my experience these fibres take dyes pretty similarly and that's probably because they're both natural protein fibres. This bears out when we compare the two fibres in the table. This gives me a really good idea for what kind of palette I can go for with purple dyes. Okay, so I'm now at the point where I've got my fabric. It is kind of a lovely shade of purple. I'm not sure if it's coming up nicely on camera at the moment. But it's sort of in the mid-range of the colours that I was aiming for, so that's pretty perfect. I uh, can't really ask for better than that. I didn't edge it before I washed it or dyed it, so I've got a little bit of fraying, but that doesn't lose too much material, thankfully. So now I've just got to iron all these creases out and get it ready for cutting. project isn't exactly the most complicated one to put together. It's essentially four rectangles and four triangles. I just piece them together, make sure that they fit to my shape, and add the straps. What I decided to do for thread for this project was instead of using linen thread like I have previously for other projects, I was going to essentially pull apart pieces of scrap fabric that I cut away from what I needed and I was going to use the threads as I pulled them out of the fabric to sew the garment together. This way those sewn threads match the colour of the garment itself, nothing stands out, uh, even when you're felling, your felling thread doesn't look out of place if it accidentally catches too much. It should all just go together really nicely. Like with most of my other projects, despite the fact that it was all straight stitching, it took a couple of days because I was working it around all my other day job stuff. But now the garment's finished, it's time for the reveal. I'm actually really happy with how this one turned out. The fit of this apron dress requires a tunic to go under it that doesn't have too much volume. So I couldn't exactly wear it over my brown tunic, which is nice and baggy. I had to wear it over this grey tunic, which is a little bit more slim fitting. If I tried to wear it over a baggy tunic, you would have seen all the little rumples and ripples of that fabric underneath the apron dress, and it wouldn't have looked nice. I wanted this to look really schmick, so nice smooth under tunic is important. And of course my favourite tortoise brooches from Blue Axe Reproductions, I've got links down to their stuff in the description below, so go check them out. So that is the final result, that is the apron dress I came up with for my Irish Viking impression with what little evidence I could pull together. If you're interested in having a look at those articles, I have linked them down in the description below for your perusal. Feel free to have a squeeze. If you've got other you know, resources that you think I might be interested in seeing, feel free to let me know about them down in the comments. I'm always interested to hear about new information. And hopefully I will see you down there in the comments. That is all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching, friends. Bye for now. Probably not going to get this all in one take. Instead, 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 instead. It's after curfew. They should be in bed. There's multiple dye analysis where we found that. Unknown yellow pigment dye. <clears throat>